Hello and welcome to another edition of VU Sports Wired. We are back. We had a little bit of a hiatus there. We are back talking some Commodore baseball today. It is the only active major Vanderbilt sport right now. Cutler Klein, Simon Gibbs, Ryan Sheehy, thank you so much as always for tuning in. We have a fantastic show for you this afternoon, bringing you all the latest news and notes from Commodore baseball as a big series with Florida approaches. And first we have to talk about what happened last weekend to the Commodores on the road in College Station, Texas, dropping two out of three to the Texas A&M Aggies. Looked like they had the series win in the bag there for a moment, up seven to two in the late innings on Saturday but blew that five-run lead and ended up costing them the game and then got shut out 7 to nothing on Sunday. Obviously, we can look at a lot of different issues with this team. The starting pitching and across the board hasn't been what, it, what it's needed to be from a lot of different players, with the exception of maybe guys like Patrick Raby. And in the bullpen, some players have struggled a lot through these games. Zach King had a really, really tough outing in that blown loss to a and &M. I mean, what, what is the biggest thing you think needs fixing with this team if they're going to be able to compete in a tough SEC schedule that includes a fellow national title contender in Florida this weekend? So we're not going to talk about Bryce Drew. So we're not going to talk about Bryce Drew yet. We, we have, we have, we have talked, greener about pastures, we have talked about Bryce greener Drew pastures. for as long as we possibly can. I think, um, as we spoke a little bit about on radio just before this, Color mentioned the bullpen pitching as his main issue. Personally, I think the bullpen pitching has been shaky, but I think our starting pitching is where you really need to focus. Um, we have, you know, only two starters that have pitched uh, five or more games, uh, being Patrick Raby with a fantastic .7 ERA, great ace to have in your rotation. Fellows, five games as well, 488 ERA is not so great. And then it goes down the line from Chance Huff, Zach King, and Kamar Rocker, who have started, you know, four or fewer games and all have a six, seven, and five ERA. I mean, that is not good. And this inconsistency is exactly what they need to avoid. The inconsistencies stretch from pitching, from starting pitching to bullpen pitching, because you don't want to have to bring in your top relievers to start games. I mean, that's just going to end up messing up the entire rotation. And once you face teams like Florida's that could put runs on the board, you're not going to have those relievers you once had. So you want to have consistency on the starting pitching, and then, of course, consistency at the plate. They did put up a goose egg last weekend. I'm not going to make much of it. It was one game. Although they did only walk twice and strike out 10 times, I think there's some room for improvement behind the plate. And then lastly, again, I'm not going to make much of this, but consistency stretches to defense. And making four errors is not going to help your case. Kamar Rocker pitched five innings, should have only had two runs, only had two earned runs, ended up letting up four because of the two unearned. And then, you know, the reliever comes in and lets up another two or three unearned runs. I mean, Vanderbilt's errors were really getting the best of them, and not like they had the run support to back it, but I feel like these are, are all little issues that may you know, come to fruition in the beginning of the season. Hopefully they can iron them out and become a more consistent team moving forward. But I think and I hope that by the time SEC play really gets into the swing of things, because you know, Texas A&M was only the first series, I think they'll be able to become a more consistent team. And that starts with solidifying your top three starting pitchers. Absolutely. And just in breaking down what went wrong in this A&M series, I mean, you look back, the first game in the series, we obviously get the W. Then from there, it just all seemed to kind of go downhill once you get to around the fourth, fifth inning of the second series on Saturday, or the second game in the series on Saturday. The starting pitching has to be better. That obviously is, I mean, you can't win without some aces in the hole, and Raby's been exactly that for them. But Rocker's more raw than we thought he was going to be. Yeah. Fellows isn't I stepping agree. up like we thought he was going to. And then on top of that, then when they try to lean on their relievers, that's just, they're not coming through in the clutch. And I think that was exemplified in not only the game on Saturday where they blew the 7-2 lead, but a smaller lead that was blown earlier that week against Austin P. That's Look, not a good lead to blow. Yeah, exactly, not a great lead to blow. I mean, that's a very small school that does not have a whole lot of aspirations for a call it for a conference title, let alone you know a national title. Yeah. So within the span of one week, two leads are blown. That is just kind of a red flag to me, especially about the relief pitchers. That okay, how are we going to secure these leads, especially in baseball where there's no clock to run out? and you have to pitch your way out of the things. Yeah. 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 
to me, you know, I, I think you see this many blown leads, and, and you have to say, you know, that's on the bullpen for blowing these leads. You, the one against A&M, the one against Austin P are two of those bigger ones where, you know, you had the lead and the bullpen just couldn't hold it together. It was different culprits each time. Zach King had a tough outing in that one, and it was definitely a combination of other pitchers against Austin P. In terms of the starters, yeah, I think Fellows is honestly a bigger kind of a bigger work in progress than Kumar Rocker is, or bigger need to step up. Kumar Rocker. Well, work in it, progress or need to step up. Those are yeah, two no, very, yeah, different, no, very different things. things. Uh, work in pro Kumar Rock, Rocker is a work in progress, okay. but, I think, but I think he progresses through playing in more games and getting more innings out there. He's he's better off. You're better off pitching him and letting him figure it out on the fly rather than benching him and giving him one or two innings and getting very little production out of perhaps one of your best pitching prospects in a long, long time. In terms of Fellows, he came in here with experience and he hasn't been able to, to, to go the distance in any of these games or go a reasonable distance in a lot of these games. And I think the Friday starter, or in this case for this week, a Thursday starter, is far more important than a Sunday one because you have to set the tone for the series. You have to get it out on the right foot. When you haven't played in a couple of days and you're finally getting back into the swing of things in this game, that th these are the type of things that you need. And I think him stepping up and him pitching a good outing this weekend against Florida is going to do far more wonders than anything they could do with the last starter in Kamar Rocker. I, I, I'm going to have to disagree there. This is a team that is not very far removed from being the number one team in the country. They've had a few bad losses, have dropped down to just, what, eight now? And this is clearly still a team with aspirations, as Ryan said earlier, to win a national championship. Kamar Rocker could have all the talent in the world. He could throw 250 miles an hour. If he's not getting it done, you keep filtering it through. You keep put, bringing in new pitchers until someone can get the job done. I don't see the whole learning on the fly thing working out well. And I, knowing or having experienced Coach Corbin's you know, coaching from, from, from afar, I feel like he's going to do just that. He's going to keep working with what he's got until he finds the hot hand and roll with him, whether it's Rocker, whether it's Fellows, whether whoever it may be, Rocker's spot in the starting rotation should not, and I would argue is not, set in stone. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, when you look at a team as Vanderbilt, we like to often label sports teams as being in win-now mode. I oh, think yeah. Vanderbilt, certainly this season, I mean, they're a perennial contender, but this season, among others, right. they are absolutely <clears throat> in what you would call a win-now mode. They just, they're coming off of the numbers one and two cla recruiting classes in the country came in ranked number one, and now that you're starting to get into some hardship, which I'll discuss in a minute, you can't just try to you know, work your way through it and build for the future when you, have, you legitimately have the potential to go out and win a national title this year. That is something that you have to take advantage of whenever it comes along, and I also agree that Tim Corbin is the type of manager who's not going to let himself get caught up on the potential of any given individual, but he wants to win and he's going to do what's necessary for the team. Yeah. yeah. I think the only reasonable alternative choice for that Sunday starter is Mason Hickman. I don't it's care. Not, it's I, not going to happen this week because he pitched on Tuesday and they're not going to roll him out for another starter. But I also think that Mason Hickman is better suited to be a stabilizing force in the bullpen because the bullpen I, has been pretty bad lately. Yeah. They have, not, they have yeah. not gotten the job done. I think Hickman's a bigger force there. <coughs> the question is, who else do you turn to to start that game, to start a pivotal Sunday game? I think you trust Kamar Rocker more than any of the other kind of younger rookies that you have there. I mean, <clears throat> I agree that Hickman has been one of the only constants in a rather inconsistent and weak bullpen. I think Hickman is best suited for the bullpen. I think bringing him to the starting rotation would be not in their best interest. But whether it's Hickman or whether it's some guy who you said the only logical alternative or something along the lines, I would argue that you keep looking until you find it. I mean, I know they're in SEC play now, and it's a little late to be experimenting, but you'd hope that by the time they get at least halfway through these SEC tournaments, they have a rotation in place, and they could also, if it means bringing in Hickman, which I hope it doesn't, you find his replacement. You, you bring Kumar Rocker into that bullpen and you give him bullpen experience. Because at the end of the day, if he blows one inning, that's much better than having a two-inning start that goes poorly. And I'm not saying he's been doing this consistently, but I, I think the learning curve for pitching one inning is a little different. And we're not bringing him into you know, three, two games in the bottom of the last inning to close the game. We're talking about middle reliever. Winning by a few runs, losing by a few runs, middle of the game, 
pressure is not the same. He's a freshman. I understand that. But if he's not getting the job done, I firmly believe that you keep looking. And I don't believe that there is any irrational you know, choice or irrational option for just one day. Because if it goes poorly, you could always rely, or hopefully, rely on your own hitting to bring you back into that game. Furthermore, it just gives you an answer moving forward that whoever pitched that day is not the answer. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, me and Simon tend to be in some agreement here on yeah. the whole idea of trying to just ease Rocker in because of his potential to be great. Yeah. If he's not great now, then that's, and if he's not producing now, that is what Tim Corbin is going to realize, and that's what he's going to alter. And wherever Rocker ends up, whether that's in the bullpen or in the starting rotation, it will be somewhere where he's developing himself while also still putting out and providing for the team. You can't try to just make him a prospect and keep him that way forever. He's here now, and he has to actually contribute to you know, you know, the team's chances of winning. Right. Yeah. I, by no means do I think Rocker's space in the, as the Sunday starter is set in stone. I don't think that at all. I think they could easily go with someone else this weekend. But I think the, your long-term plan throughout the, by the end of the season is to have Rocker pitching in that third spot. Well, of course, that's the ideal situation. But if he keeps pitching the way he's pitching, it makes no yeah. sense. No, yeah, of course. If he keeps pitching the way he's pitching, you have to be able to take him out of there. But for now, I think the sample size is small enough where you're still in that, OK, well, I don't, we don't want to do anything drastic yet. And, just completely yank him from that and, and relegate him to bullpen duty. You know, I, I think there's certainly a lot of different aspects at play here they have to take a look at. But long term, your idea has to be Kamar Rocker is going to be that going to be that guy on the Sunday going forward. But I'd argue if there's ever a better time to just put him in the bullpen for the weekend, it's going to be against Florida. I mean, this is after losing the series to Texas A&M, dropping a game to Austin P. I'm not going to really count that one, but losing the opening SEC series is bad. They're, they're a great team. Texas A&M is a great team. I'll give them all the credit in the world. It's not the end of the world that Vanderbilt lost that series. But you need to bounce back in a big way against a big team like Florida on this stage at home. And I think there's no better way to do that than to roll with the punches. If one guy is not feeling it, shouldn't be in that starting lineup. That's how I feel so, about so, it. So, so I mean, in that case, I mean, so, so your next alternative is, in theory, Chance Huff, who's been a, really, a pretty stellar freshman at this point, but he doesn't go very deep into games. So essentially you're resigning yourself to a kind of bullpen game and now we've got, on Sunday. And, and, and now we've got Kamar Rocker in the bullpen. So essentially if you're saying you would go Huff, Rocker, and then go through more of the bullpen. I would rather through. filter through. That's, I, I, Kamar Rocker has also, opposing batters have been hitting 298 against Kamar Rocker. That's not good. That's the highest of any pitcher on the team. And of course he's going to improve. I have no doubt in my mind that this system is the perfect system for him. But most players, with the exception of, you know, the Pat DeMarcos of the world, most of them have to work their way up to where he is. None of them come into Vanderbilt and immediately get put in the starting rotation. It's very tough to do. And granted, there was a lot of turnover in the past year. And there are a lot of question marks in the bullpen, too. I really think this has got to be a, you know, put, the, put pu different puzzle pieces in different places until you solve it. Because right now, the way it's working out is... is putting Vanderbilt's offense in a very tough spot because yeah. they're forfeiting many runs a game. And also, you mentioned blowing the leads. I mean, until that stops, they haven't solved the problem. Right, that, that is true. So but before we get any further, let's move on to talk about this weekend series against Florida. We started getting into it a little bit. Florida is another top 10, top 5 team. These, this could very well be an Omaha preview coming up this weekend. It should be a really fun time. Make sure you go and get out there Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday afternoon. You can check beer out tent. The, yeah. Beer Tent, the home run lounge. Check it out. Get your buzz on with the Vandy boys. It's <laughs> going to be a good time. So but in terms of all the stuff going on on the field, what do you think is the most important thing that Vanderbilt can do this weekend to, to spring this against Florida and to get themselves back on track with a series win? I think, of course, consistency, which is what I spoke about just now. but one thing I want to harp on is the 24-hour rule. And I mean, I don't mean literally 24 hours, but I mean this past series. I hope they've learned from it. They cannot be thinking about that. If you get a lead against Florida and you have the slightest memory of blowing a lead to Texas A&M, you can bet that Florida's going to make that lead disappear. And this is a team that can really score a lot of runs really quickly. And against an uncertain pitching staff, 
I would hope that they've learned from the mistakes they made last weekend, and it is pa they're past it. They're not going to be thinking about blowing a lead to Texas A&M because Florida is going to make it so much worse. I don't know if you can say they're certain that they're not going to be thinking about it. For I'm saying they should. That's my advice. They say it 100% should, <laughs> but I don't know if that's going to be something that they're able to do. Yeah. After all, this is a team that routinely sends a lot of people to the pros. You have new guys coming in all the time. We just talked about the turnover in the pitching roster. There's going to be some, some youth there, some inexperience. And on top of that, Florida, as much as Vanderbilt's a perennial contender and we talk about them, that's, you know, they're a baseball powerhouse. Florida is even more so. Florida is like that there's always a bigger fish almost to Vanderbilt in that they've won, I believe it's four years in a row they've won the series. They have a history of playing Vanderbilt tough in the SEC tournament. The, if, if they ever meet in the College World Series, they've had encounters. And Vanderbilt has just always kind of gotten the short end of the stick when it comes to matchups with Florida. So self-confidence, as you said, is very important, but I'm not sure if they're going to be able to really just some doubts off their mind. I mean, this is this is almost like trying to slay the dragon a little bit in that this is, for Florida's, aside from maybe LSU, is pretty much the peak of SEC baseball. So trying to figure out how they're going to slay that dragon. One, you said consistency. Absolutely, we have, you have to keep, you have to do what makes you win and you have to do it over and over and over and over again. And what they've been doing is they're kind of coming into patches here and there over a couple of these games, and then they just all almost kind of like it turns around mid-game and they seem to forget who they are. You see, obviously, we see that in the games where they've lost leads. Beyond that, I don't think the offense for Vanderbilt is that much of an issue here. Really, they seem to be able to put up runs. The problem lies in trying to keep points off the board, and I know that's a little bit of a don't 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 have recency bias just because they got shut out on Sunday. Yeah. But for the most part, they I mean, they added seven runs on Saturday, I believe it was eight or nine on Friday. Yeah. They, they're, they're scoring plenty. It's just a matter of making sure that Florida stays off the board. And that is going to fall to those pitchers who are going to have to really have some mental fortitude and like not get ahead of themselves. Yeah. And this four errors cannot happen again. No, I don't no, think it, it will, it but it four errors happen. happening again against I, Florida yeah. would be detrimental. Yeah. I, I think that very much feeds into the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Tim Corbin's the type of coach that would not let that happen oh, again. No. It absolutely wouldn't. But I, 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 do, I do agree with you all that this series is going to be a high-scoring, high-octane affair. I mean, you, you saw in the A&M series, you know, you, you saw seven-run games. You saw some high-scoring. But I think this one is going to be on a whole other level just because both of these teams can put up numbers so well. I mean, how does that change the dynamic where you're expecting, you know, just this incredible offensive display and you're expecting that high-scoring? Ooh. I mean, it'd be fun to watch for sure. Yeah, and it'd be yeah, fun to watch. But I mean, and at the, and at the, yeah, and at the same time, you know, you you know that no lead is safe. You could build out a, a six four a six to one lead in the eighth inning and still lose the game, very and it, very easily. It's, it's only a couple of swings and you could drop that game. So that's what I think is going to be the biggest thing in play here is that both of these teams really know how to score some runs. So it'll be interesting to watch that one. Finally, moving on, slightly back to the hardwood here. The NCAA tournament starts on Thursday, so we're going to make our final four picks here live on the show. Final four and championship coming up first round this weekend. I hope every professor knows that nobody is paying attention in class this week. And I mean nobody. And I mentioned this before, pour one out for all the students that have to go through class without laptops and have classes in which laptops are banned. That is going to be a tough week for them. We're thinking about you. Keep track of it on your phone. We believe in you. Uh, so final four picks. I'll go through mine first. On the left side of the bracket, Duke and Michigan. Two kind of easy picks there. Michigan's a really solid team. Duke is the fighting Zions. I think they'll be, they'll <laughs> be fine. On the other side, getting weird here, Wisconsin and Houston. Wisconsin. Coming out of that region. Oh. Wisconsin is my, uh, is my real underdog Houston. pick. In the, in, the, in the championship, I have Houston upsetting the Duke Blue Devils to win the national championship and to spark outcry about Zion Williamson's ability to close out basketball games. And we just spoke about this in radio, but how many teams have there been in the past few years that weren't blue yeah, to, well, to cut down the net? Technically only two. Because technically only two when you have, when it, which, in which it's, what is it, Syracuse and Maryland. Right. Are the only two with, since 2000. Florida is blue. Uh, yeah, the only two, yeah, since blue. Florida's won a title and, are, and is technically and blue, 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 blue,
Louisville won and is red, but their vacant. title was vacant. Yeah. So you can't deal with that. Th these are the very minute details that we bring you here on VU Sports Wired. Y you're welcome. You're welcome. Simon, your picks. So I'm going to go with the two easy ones first. Um, Duke from the East. I am super anti-Duke. Almost every year I pick them getting upset prior to the Sweet 16. You just can't do it this year. I think this is too talented of a team, and I think, barring injury, this team's going to cruise to the Final Four. And I see UNC coming out of the Midwest, another pretty self-explanatory, and experienced coaching staff and team. And then here's where mine gets weird. I have Cincinnati, seventh seed Cincinnati, coming out of the South. Wow. I have wow. Cincinnati winning the first round, <coughs> and in the second round, they should play against assuming some miraculous upset doesn't happen, they should be playing Tennessee in the second round. Tennessee is the best two seed in the country. They are the fifth ranked team right now in the tournament. Yet, they somehow got the gift from the selection committee of playing, for all intents and purposes, an away game in the second round of the tournament. If Cincinnati wins this game, they're going to Columbus, Ohio for a neutral game. That's not a very neutral location, and I see Tennessee falling victim to the same things they did against a huge Vanderbilt crowd that one time they came out here, get a little riled and, you know, no hook and hold calls, and Vanderbilt won that game. I see Cincinnati winning that game. I see them heating up. Cincinnati is 30-2, and two, or sorry, 20-2 and two when shooting at least 30% from behind the arc, and they are fourth in the country in percentage of offensive rebounds corralled. So if they could keep getting that long ball to fall and rebounding their missed shots, they could catch fire pretty quickly. And then I see Florida State out the West. And you see, mm. this one is, is definitely not, is not the trending pick, but it is not, I mean, there are plenty of other people out there who have picked, I mean, Betsy and Radia just had the exact same picks as me. Florida State's an interesting team. They have a great defense. And this team traveled to the Elite Eight last year. You can't overlook that. Yeah. I mean, this is a veteran team with experience in the tournament. I think they'll be able to cruise through that side of the bracket eventually beating Gonzaga, which will be their toughest test. And, of course, I have, once again, a rematch of Duke-UNC in the finals, which oh. would be a wild game. It'd be insane. And, of course, I said it earlier, I'm not going to pick Duke to win. So, for no good reason other than I'm not picking Duke to win, I'm picking UNC to win. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I think that West region is going to just be bananas yeah. in terms of all the upsets there because you got Murray State in there. Right. You have FSU. You have Baylor. Is that Buffalo, Baylor, Syracuse. Nevada. Buffalo's in that region. I believe Texas Nevada's Tech. In that region. Nevada, yeah. Florida. Yeah. Michigan's in there too. That region is going to be crazy. Yeah. 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 Ryan, your picks? All right. So mine are a little bit more sane than these two. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as many upsets, but that's how it normally shakes out anyway. So maybe I'll win my bracket. Loyola Chicago, yeah. baby. Loyola yeah. Chicago. I picked go, Loyola go, Chicago go, sister last Jean. Year. You did not. I picked in the final four. Oh, oh, oh. oh. I after that's still I, pretty, I them pretty impressive. Them I think either the Sweet 16 or the Elite Eight. I was like, Look at that. Shy of oh, wow. Game. Go, sister Jean. <laughs> go, sister Jean. No, but um, yeah, Duke, I, I've got Duke coming out of the East. Um, not, it's not going to be as easy a matchup against Michigan State as a lot of people are thinking it's going to be. That Michigan State team is a very, very good basketball team that's better than Cutler's Michigan team. <laughs> and they got absolutely just, they got destroyed by the committee and that they got put from Duke's group after they 3 0 Michigan in the Big Ten play. Coming out of the Midwest, I actually have Houston as well, Cutler. Um, yeah. I think that's a very good Houston team that if you if you were watching the tournament last year, probably should have gone farther than they did, got beat by a buzzer beater, if I recall right, against San Diego State. But th th have no worries. They're going on this year. Kentucky is going to choke, as they have oh. a couple times in the yeah. Calipari against Houston. And UNC Houston is going to be a great game, but I see Houston coming out on top. From the West, great, great group. I think Michigan is overrated. That was a bit of a jab earlier with the huh. Michigan State yeah. thing. But I've still got Gonzaga coming out, but I can completely see them being upset, particularly by either Florida State or Texas Tech. 
Texas Tech is a three seed that seems to be flying under the radar. All these three seeds tend to be flying under the Texas radar. Texas Tech yeah. and the, 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 the Texas three seeds yeah. <laughs> between yeah. Texas Tech and Houston. Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. I would love to see those two red teams That'd make it incredible. into the final. And then LSU, I mean, LSU is obviously getting overlooked for a number of different reasons. And then Purdue. Well, and and overlooked is debatable, though, because of the, the coaching situation. Yeah, no, but, but, but they're being written off. I would say overlooked isn't the wrong word, written off because yeah. of the coaching situation. Yeah, I do agree with that. But, and then finally, coming out of the South, I've got, uh, I've got Virginia. Um, Makes they're, sense. They're, 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 they're just, it, it's kind of a matter of if they can put it all together. They might be almost, this is going to sound really hot, but they might almost be as talented, as good of a team as Duke is. Ooh. It's just they don't, they haven't traditionally put it together. I was going to, I was going to, yeah. Like, I mean, you look at it, the past two regular seasons, they have, what, four losses? And then they become the first one seed to ever lose in the men's wow. tournament last year. Better be worried if they can't get out of the first round this year. If they can get out of the first round this year, I'm just. That would be something out. else. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to go to one of those. Uh, I'm, I might have to hit up the baseball game at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. 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 You, yeah. yeah. You, UVA, I have trust issues with UVA because I picked them to win it all last year. I only that is my problem. Yes. I. But, you know. Picking a smart thing and then having some craziness occur does not mean yeah, that you continue to pick the smart thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's I, I definitely have, right. We're gonna look we're gonna look pretty player. stupid if our brackets yeah. are really wrong, which they could be. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean a lot of the upsets you guys have talked about make sense. Cincinnati over Tennessee is absolutely a possibility. Cutler brought up Houston, obviously I agree with that. But I mean, there, there's all kinds of places where there's good teams that have kind of either flown under the radar or have been seated a little too low. Wisconsin, fun fact, I believe it's the past five or six times that they've gone to the tournament have at least made the Sweet 16. Yeah. So, Cutler, you've got a decent chance of getting yeah. a good wave with them. I don't know about Final Four, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, so let's see, Final Four, I've got, um, I've got Virginia beating Houston, and then Duke beating Gonzaga, and then I've got Duke taking Virginia for the title. So another ACC oh, yeah, final. Yeah, a a ACC is... Uh, is maybe the best boss basketball conference, but they don't have SEC basketball fever. Right, but they also don't have the worst team in the Power Five. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Right. Yes. That sounds really yeah. bad to say, but at the same time, it's so it's, accurate. It is very it's accurate. It, 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 it's true. It's, it's numbers. These, these, are, these are facts. <laughs> these are facts. With that, that'll do it for this week's episode of VU Sports <laughs> Wired. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. For Ryan Sheehy, Simon Gibbs, I'm Cutler Klein. So long, and we'll see you next time.